So in the last couple of videos, we looked at how to evaluate some basic integrals using the method of contour integration. And with those previous examples, there was a variety of methods you could have used to tackle them. And contour integration, while it is a very powerful method, was something of an overkill, really, when it came to integrals that could potentially have been done with a simple trig substitution. And I want to show you some examples of integrals where it's almost a necessity for you to use contour integration. So in this case, I've got a different function in the integrand. I've got the integral from 0 to infinity of the cosine of x, all divided by x squared plus 1 dx. So I'm going to use the method of contour integration. And you'll see below the integral, I've got my contour already set up. So as usual, I'm going to use a semicircular contour. I'm using a semicircular contour because that's what I need to capture the information of this integral. I've got something going along the real line. Uh, just by looking at it, I can't see any poles that lie on the real line, so this should work. Um, I'm also going to take r to be greater than 1 because I can see there's going to be a pole at plus and minus i already, so I don't want my contour to pass through that pole. That would be a bad thing. So my semicircle is of radius r, as usual. It's traversed in the anti-clockwise sense. Uh, it's got a straight part along the real axis and a curved part, uh, which I've called gamma sub r. And I'm going to call this whole contour c. So now what I've got to do is I've got to define my function. And I'm going to define it like this. I'm going to say that f of z is equal to, well, you might think I'd, I would put uh, cosine of z all divided by z squared plus 1, but I'm actually not going to do that. I'm going to use the exponential function, e to the iz of z squared plus 1. And you'll see why I do that by the end of this video. But in general, if you've got a cosine or a sine term here, um, then you're going to want to use an exponential function. Okay, so by construction, what do I have? What are the integrals that I, I can set up? Well, from the information and from uh, this, this picture, I can see that the integral over c, my function f of z, dz, that's equal to the integral over this segment from minus r to r, so from minus r to r of f of x dx. Remember that I've uh, replace the z with an x because I'm going along the real axis, so x is the only thing that's varying, um, plus the integral of the gamma sub r, so that's the curved part. So I've essentially summed the integrals over the, the straight line and the curve of my function f of z dz. So I've now got three different integrals to worry about, and the middle integral is the integral I'm most interested in, because when I um, solve for this, I'll end up uh, in effect solving for this integral. So that leaves uh, this integral here on the left and this integral on the far right. So for the integral on the far right, I'm going to use the estimation lemma. And on the, for the integral on the left, I'm going to use the residue theorem. But to use the residue theorem, I first need to understand the poles of this function. So what are the poles of this function? Or rather, f of z equals e to the iz over z squared plus 1. Where are the poles of that function? So let's look at the poles of that function. So f of z is equal to e to the iz all over z squared plus 1. Now the exponential function is entire in the complex plane, meaning that it's analytic or differentiable everywhere in the complex plane. So it doesn't have any poles. On the other hand, the denominator certainly has poles because this vanishes at two particular points. We know that if z squared plus 1 is equal to 0, and that means that z squared is equal to minus 1, and this equation has solutions uh, z equals i and z equals minus i. So for these values of z, uh, this function vanishes. Or rather, this function uh, has is, is undefined, so I've got a pole at, this, at these two points. So let's label these two points in my diagram. So I've got a pole at i and a pole at minus i. And you notice that one of these poles lies inside my contour c, and one of these poles does not. So I don't need to worry about the, the contour, or rather the pole that doesn't lie inside the contour. I'm going to worry about the pole that lies inside c. So let's try to find the residue at this point i, which lies inside my contour. So let's find the residue at the point i. So I want to find the residue 
of my function f of z at the point z equals i. So the residue is given by the limit as z approaches i of z minus my pole, which is i, times my function, which is e to the iz over z squared plus 1. So that's e to the iz, all divided by z squared plus 1. Well, what can I do now? Well, I can factorize the denominator because I know that this factorizes to z minus i times z plus i because I found the poles. So let's do that. This becomes the limit as z approaches i of z minus i e to the i z all divided by z minus i times z plus i. So I've now got a factor of z minus i in the numerator and in the denominator. So I'm going to cancel out these factors like so. And once I've done that, I'm left with this. I've got the limit as z approaches i. Well, I've got e to the i z left over. So e to the i z, all divided by z plus i, because I've cancelled out my factors. And at this point, I should have no problem substituting for i. I can just set z equal to i, and then I've got my value for the limit. So when I plug in i, what do I get? Well, I get e to the i times i. So I get e to the i squared, e to the i squared all divided by i plus i. Well, i squared by definition is minus 1. So this is just e to the minus 1, all divided by 2i. This is exactly the same thing as 1 over 2ie, just written differently. OK, so that's the residue at the point z equals i. That's the residue of my function at the pole that I'm interested in. So now we can use the residue theorem because that's the only pole that lies inside my contour. So I can use the residue theorem to evaluate my contour integral. So the residue theorem says that the integral over c of my function f of z dz, that's equal to 2 pi i times the sum of my residues. So that's 2 pi i times the sum of my residues. But there's only one residue in this example. So I just multiply that by 2 i e. And when I do that, I get 2i pi all over 2ie. And I can cancel out a factor of 2i in the numerator and the denominator. So what I'm left with is just pi over e. OK, so now I've used the residue theorem. I've got to deal with the last remaining integral on the far right. So I want to now deal with this integral. So the integral of my function f of z dz of a gamma sub r. And I've already dealt with this integral, so this one's done. So I now need to deal with this one. So I'm going to use the estimation lemma. So the estimation lemma says this. So the absolute value of my function, or the integral of my function, f of z, integrated over gamma sub r, that's the arc of my semicycle, dz, that is bounded or less than or equal to the length of gamma sub r times the maximum value of the absolute value of my function f of z, where z varies along this curve, or at least the arc of this semicircle. So just as before, I know that the length of my arc is just pi r. Why is it pi r? Well, if you think about a circle, so let's go back to my diagram. If you think about a circle that's of radius r, we know that the circumference of that circle is just 2 pi r. So this arc is half of the circumference of a circle of radius r, so I've got to halve the circumference. And 2 pi r halved is just pi r. So the length of this uh, curve is pi r. So that's why the length of gamma r is pi r. I've now got to deal with the maximum value of this thing, where z varies along the curve. OK, so there are two parts of this. I know that my function is e to the iz over z squared plus 1. So let's deal with the z squared plus 1 component first. I'm going to use the reverse triangle inequality, as I usually do, on z squared plus 1. So the absolute value of z squared plus 1. That is greater than or equal to the absolute value of z squared minus 1. Now, just as before, on gamma sub r, we have that the absolute value of z equals r. So I'll write this here. So on gamma sub r, the absolute value of z is equal to r. 
because every point in that curve is the same distance from the origin. So if I go back to my diagram, every point in this curve lies a distance of r from the origin because I've got a, a semicircle of radius r. So every point in this curve is a distance r from the origin. So in this case, the absolute value of z is just r. So this is r squared minus 1. I can now invert my inequality, which says that if I take the reciprocal of both sides, I get that the absolute value, or 1 over the absolute value of z squared plus 1, is less than or equal to 1 over r squared minus 1. So it's looking good so far. This looks like something, uh, when, I take, you know, when I take the limit of this thing as r goes to infinity, I'm going to get something that tends to 0. So, so far it's looking good. As long as I don't get something fishy happening in the numerator, then I'm good. So now I've dealt with the uh, z squared plus 1 part of my function, I've now got to deal with the exponential part. So let's deal with the exponential part. Remember my function was defined as follows, so it was e to the iz over z squared plus 1. So I've now dealt with this part, it's time to deal with this part. So I've got the absolute value of e to the iz, and I want to find some way of bounding this, preferably involving r. Well, it doesn't have to involve r, but it usually does. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a trick. Remember that a complex number z is written uh, in terms of its real and imaginary parts. So if I had z, I could write it as x plus i y, where x and y were real numbers and i is the imaginary unit. Instead of writing it as x plus i y, I'm going to write it as the real part of z plus i times the imaginary part of z. It means exactly the same thing. Uh, but you'll see why I do that in a second. So I've got the absolute value of e to the i, and I'm going to write z equivalently as the real part of z plus i times the imaginary part of z in absolute values. Now if I expand the brackets, what do I get? Well, I get the absolute value of e to the i times the real part of z, and using properties of the exponential function, I also get that times e to the i squared, that's i times i imaginary part of z, so e to the i squared times the imaginary part of z. Now I can split this up using properties of the modulus, and this just becomes the absolute value of e to the i times the real part of z, multiplied by the absolute value of e to the i squared times the imaginary part of z. But i squared is, by definition, minus 1. So this just becomes minus the imaginary part of z. OK, well, this term actually is just 1. Why is it 1? Well, um, using the representation of a complex number, I know that e to the i x, well, e to the i times any real number, is just the cosine of that number plus i times the sine of that number. And the absolute value of that is always 1, because if you uh, look at the cos plus i sine form, it always traces out a unit circle um, if r is equal to 1. So this, the absolute value of this thing is just equal to 1. So this vanishes. So I'm left with the following. I'm left with the absolute value of e to the minus the imaginary part of z. Now. The exponential of a real number, so e to the power of a real number, is always non-negative, so it's never a negative number. So if I take the absolute value of it, I still get the same thing back. So I can actually just drop the absolute value signs. So this is just e to the power of minus the imaginary part of z. So what do I do now? Well, if I go back to my contour, so this is my contour, my semicircle, you'll notice one thing. Um, about this curve. Well, we're only focusing on z belonging to gamma sub r. And for every point z on this curve, it satisfies this. Well, the imaginary part of z, where z belongs to uh, this, that's always greater than or equal to 0. Right? Because I've, I've got nothing below the real axis. Everything is always on or above the real axis. So it satisfies this inequality. The imaginary part of z is always non negative. But if imaginary part of z is greater than or equal to 0, so if the imaginary part of z is greater than or equal to 0, that says that minus the imaginary part of z is less than or equal to 0. Now if I uh, 
if I exponentiate both sides, then that tells me that e to the minus imaginary part of z is less than or equal to e to the zero, and e to the zero is just one. So in summary, I found that the absolute value of e to the i z is just bounded by one. Okay, so putting it all together, what have I got? Well, I found that e to the iz in absolute values divided by the absolute value of z squared plus 1, that's less than or equal to 1, all divided by r squared minus 1. Now this looks very, very helpful because I know that when I take the limit as r goes to infinity, this thing will vanish, meaning my integral will vanish, which is exactly what I want. So going back to my integral and the estimation lemma, I've got that the absolute value of my integral over gamma sub r of my function f of z dz, we know that that's now bounded by 1 over r squared minus 1. And now when I take the limit as r goes to infinity, so I take the limit as r goes to infinity, this thing tends to 0. So this goes to 0. And if this goes to zero, then my integral goes to zero. So the contribution of this integral is just zero. Okay, so now I've dealt with the last integral. So I can put a tick under this one. So that one's now done. I'm now left with that one. So if we now put all the information we have together, this is what we got. Okay, so we've got the integral of my function f of z dz over the contour c that's equal to the integral from minus r to r of f of x dx plus the integral of a gamma sub r, that's the curve of my semicircle, of f of z dz. Now we found two things. We know from the residue theorem that this integral was just equal to pi over e. And taking the limit as r went to infinity, we found that this integral just went to zero. And if r goes to infinity, this integral just becomes, well, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x dx. So now if I take the limit as r goes to infinity, what do I get? Well, from the information that I've just told you, I now have that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x dx, which is just e to the i x, replacing z with x, over x squared plus 1 dx, is equal to pi over e. So we're getting very close to our solution now, except I've got an e to the i x here. Now remember that e to the i x is just the cosine of x plus i times sine x. So this tells me that I've got the integral from minus infinity to infinity of cosine x dx, all divided by x squared plus 1, plus i times the integral of the sine of x, all over x squared plus 1, dx from minus infinity to infinity and that's equal to pi over e. Well I'm now going to take the real parts of both sides. I mean this integral is also interesting but it's not the integral that I'm concerned with. I'm only concerned with this one. So if I take the real parts of both sides, after all both of these integrals are real, I have the following. So taking real parts, so taking real parts, I end up having that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the cosine of x all over x squared plus 1 dx, that's equal to pi over e. Now the cosine of x is an even function and x squared plus 1 is also an even function. So this whole integrand cos x over x squared plus 1 is also an even function. So since this is an even function, the integral from minus infinity to 0 and the integral from 0 to infinity are the same. So I can do this. I can simply double the integral taken over the range from 0 to infinity because it's the same in both directions of the cosine of x all divided by x squared plus 1 dx. That's equal to pi over e. Now what I've got to do now is divide both sides by 2. So when I divide both sides by 2, I should get my solution. So I therefore have that the integral from 0 to infinity of the cosine of x all divided by x squared plus 1 dx is equal to pi over 2e. And that's my solution.